So um, I think what's up next is um, we're going to um, uh, have a conversation with Tom Cook of Spacely and some others, et cetera. But first, I'd like to thank, you know, again, our sponsors, not only uh, TMG Core, but um, Millennium Space Systems mm -hmm. and Viasat. Viasat, uh, the satellite company, Millennium Space Systems. Uh, we really appreciate, uh, appreciate Craig Miller's leadership there uh, with Viasat and uh, Jason Kim. CEO of uh, Boeing's Millennium Space Systems. Mm -hmm. They've been staunch supporters. They're doing very interesting things. They're great opportunities for careers. Um, I know that Millennium is hiring, uh, you know, uh, rapidly. They're mm -hmm. looking for STEM, you know, mm -hmm. uh, educated people. They're looking for engineers, and uh, can't uh, can't recommend them you know, any more highly. They're they're, right. they're brilliant. Right. No, that's fantastic. It really is, and it's great to see people like that. You know, so so often you 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 want the opportunity for people like that to jump on board, and a lot of times they say, "No, no, no, we're good to go. We're good." Yeah. So it's nice to have them involved like this. Yeah, I, and I think they it's are great. They're thought leaders. And, yeah, that's uh, that's and, what I mean. And they're but so many people kind of keep it to themselves. But this is nice yeah. that they can yeah. they can and share it. They're out there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about the workforce of the future. We talked okay. about these companies, uh, great companies hiring, and we've got uh, Tom Cook should be coming up here. We also have Steve Rader. I'll let you do the introductions, et cetera, like you do so well. But um, I'm just really uh, uh, keen on this discussion because we need the people. You have to have the talent. You have to have the educated people. <laughs> it's kind of important. Thank yeah. you. And, and, you know, the Chinese crank out more, you know, computer scientists than we do all degrees mm -hmm. total every year, right? Um, so guys, somebody has to make things, somebody has to do things, somebody has to design and engineer them, you know, um, you know, we, 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 we need, need to get back to basics a little bit on that. Absolutely. And, and, and that's where the opportunities are. That's where the great paying jobs are. So, and these yeah. are great companies yeah. to go to work for. Keep our fingers crossed, huh? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about, uh, Tom. I sure will. Look at the old specs on here. For those of you that might not know it, uh, Tom Cook is the co-founder and uh, CEO of Spacely. This is a digital marketplace connecting independent workers to the aerospace industry. So it's, a, it's amazing what he has uh, become a part of. Tom is an Air Force Academy graduate, that's right, Colorado Springs, and spent 16 of his 24 years of service in the Air Force in space systems development and operations. And after retiring from the Air Force back in uh, 2017, just four years ago, he began researching open talent marketplace utilization across industries and potential applications for the aerospace industry. And this led to the formation of Spacely. That took place just last year in January of 2020. And in June of 2020, Spacely was selected to be part of a five-year contract effort to bring forward aerospace-specific expertise to support NASA's open innovation efforts through an open talent marketplace model. So talk about a, a guy that's a, a creator of sorts. Yeah, that's really solver. fantastic. That just fascinating. It is, yeah. and uh, it's a it's a an approach, a dynamic uh, that, that is needed. Uh, Absolutely, uh, in the new in the new workforce. And so, um, if we have Tom, that's great. If not, I would be, love to talk to Steve and to Rob. Um, hello, sir. How are you today? Great, fantastic. How are you all? Good, good, good. Great good. to see you. Great to see uh, you. We'll we will turn it over to you. Well, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you guys for the great introduction. We really appreciate it. Uh, as I said, I'm Tom Cook, co-founder and CEO of Spacely. And today I'm pleased to be moderating a panel on future of work implications uh, to our industry and how open talent marketplaces can be part of a strategic talent sourcing strategy alongside more traditional employment models in order to address the labor issues we're seeing right now in our industry. We have two great panelists today who are successfully deploying future of work models at incredible scale. Rob Biederman is the co-founder and chairman of Catalan Technologies, a freelance marketplace connecting Fortune 50 companies with exceptional talent. He's a current executive fellow at Harvard Business School where he earned his MBA. His undergraduate work was in economics from Princeton and he spent time afterward as an analyst at Goldman Sachs and an associate at Bain Capital. He recently became managing partner for Asymmetric Capital Partners, which provides expansion capital for disruptive tech companies. He's also an author of best-selling business book, Reimagining Work. Welcome, Rob. Great to be here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Steve Rader is the program manager for NASA's Tournament Lab in the Center of Excellence for Collaborative Innovation. Steve is sought after for speaking engagements globally on NASA's efforts to reach outside the organization to tap into expertise to help generate new ideas and solve complex problems through crowdsourcing and challenges. Recently, the open innovation efforts he helps lead have expanded into micro-task and micro-purchasing, opening up new pathways for independent workers to engage with NASA. Steve has been a leading voice for open talent marketplaces and the important value they bring to organizations. Welcome to you, Steve. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. 
Fantastic. Rob, let's start with you. Uh, the book offers leaders a framework for fundamentally rethinking talent strategies for organizations, whether they be global enterprises or startups or anything in between. Many corporations are burdened with an inflexible, outdated human capital model that can't meet the demands of current business cycles. Simultaneously, in today's one-demand economy, talented workers are seeking a series of projects that are flexible, purpose-driven, and give them more control and ownership over the work. This is from your book, which was written in 2017, three years before the pandemic. What led you to this hypothesis, and how has Catalan provided a solution ever since? Uh, thanks, Tom. It's great, great to be here. I did not plan on this incredibly uh, coincidental background. I'm actually at a, the office. <laughs> I know. I'm in loving that. In San Francisco, you can tell the sun hasn't yet come up. It's quite early out here. Um, so we, we started Catalan in 2013, and we had a simple idea, which was that over the preceding, call it 200 years, the concept of work and of job had become inextricably linked. They'd essentially become the same thing. And we had this, this sort of premonition, and we obviously couldn't have foreseen the pandemic, that work and job were actually going to become completely disaggregated. And that the concept of a nine to five W2 in the office every single day uh, was at least going to lose market share and hopefully um, in, in, in our uh, intent go the way of the dodo over the next kind of decade. Um, and that's exactly what we've seen even before the pandemic, which has obviously accelerated it, which is that the most thoughtful companies, GE and Pfizer and Moderna and many others in our case, um, have decided to think outside of the four walls of their company and outside of the W2 employment model, because they've realized that it's not possible with the amount of uh, different skill sets that they require with no uh, lead time at all uh, to staff full-time employees against all the things they need to do. And it's a model that we think is significantly less conducive for worker happiness uh, than being able to bounce from interesting assignment to interesting assignment. And we now have almost 100,000 people on our platform doing more than $100 million of revenue. And I think most importantly, driving unbelievable customer outcomes, again, where fully 80, 90% of people on our platform in a pre-pandemic world were working remotely uh, for companies that they would never actually meet in person. Fantastic. Steve, NASA has really smart people working on really hard problems, but even how compelling and exciting the NASA projects and missions are, you don't necessarily have all the expertise you need in-house. How did you convince NASA to reach outside the agency to get access to talent and solutions you didn't have internally? And, and why didn't traditional consulting services not serve the need? Yeah, well, first, thanks for having me. It's great to be on with Tom because Tom, Tom's got a great crowd, especially. And Rob, I've uh, always been a fan of you uh, and, and I read your book. It's great. Love what you're doing, uh, Callan. So um, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I have convinced everyone at NASA to use these <laughs> tools. First off, uh, you know, we've been doing this for about 10 years. This is our 10 year anniversary for the Center of Excellence at, uh, for Collaborative Innovation at NASA. And uh, it has been a struggle. Um, I will tell you, there is a business case study that if you take the Harvard Business School course on innovation that you'll take that's called Houston, we have a problem that is about our workforce rejecting these methods. Um, and I, it, it's, it is hard for the traditional workforce who, especially at NASA where you know, you come in, you are the innovator. You hired me to solve hard problems uh, for, for them to accept the idea of, well, we're going to go outside to actually innovate or to get expertise. That, that just, that doesn't compute. And so what we really had to do is reframe the, the problem and say, look, <laughs> this, this isn't about replacing the best part of your job, right? But rather the world has changed and the complexities and the amount of technology that's out there is simply not, not something that individuals can navigate anymore. And it happens that open talent and open innovation are methods to tap into those new skills, new technologies that's really effective. It's kind of like a dragnet across all these industries and technology areas. And so we tell them, look, you can't do your job effectively. You don't have the right starting point to innovate unless you're tapping into open innovation and open talent. And I will say that combined with building cases that work and really just examples of success uh, where we've found willing participants, gotten with them, 
run open innovation challenges, found open talent experts, brought them in. That experience starts to get a word of mouth uh, uh, spread. And we're now getting that to where we don't actually have to uh, advertise nearly as much around the agency, but rather people are coming to us uh, and we're operating something like uh, 90 to 100 projects at a time uh, because the success is obvious that, that people are able to do more, they're able to tap into better, uh, better technologies, better uh, folks than they, they thought they could. Fantastic. Along those lines, as you're reaching out uh, to those groups and they come up and they have their own intellectual property uh, or they have intellectual property you have to address, how do you, how do you, what measures do you have for implementing and integrating those solutions that come from those open talent marketplaces back into the agency? Yeah, it's funny. I, I talk about open innovation and open talent uh, multiple times a week for the last eight years. And almost every time the first question is, what about IP? Like everyone wants to know. Um, so it, it's a real thing, right? Uh, you, it's, it's not something you don't have to worry about. But first off, we tell our folks, don't, don't share sensitive information. Don't share uh, anything that's especially ITAR or anything like that. But realize that there are ways to break a problem down to where you aren't exposing anything. You can strip out the context, right? If you need a lighter life support system, go look at the problem and understand what's your heaviest components. And maybe you just start doing a, a challenge or work on what's a lighter compressor or a lighter fan, right? So there are ways to kind of deconstruct problems to get out of that. But moreover, a lot of these platforms deal with businesses all the time that have that very concern. And so a lot of times they're very good at obscuring the problem. And in fact, um, I was actually on a panel with uh, the CEO of TopCoder, uh, Mike Morris, and was, was talking about the story where the CIA had told us that they ran a challenge on TopCoder, but the challenge on TopCoder didn't say anything about CIA. In fact, it was, how do you track a bison in Yellowstone National Park using only social media uploads of tourists. And, you know, they actually successfully came up with an algorithm, but the reality was the CIA needed an algorithm to track Russians in Crimea. Um, and, and that was how they did that. So there's, there's lots of examples of obscuration and how that worked. Um, and then there's also the security concern, right? That comes along with IP, which is, hey, but what about the hacker that's going to inject code that you know somebody's going to come in and do something bad? And we put lots of of measures in there to to protect the products that we bring in against those things as well. So we have lots of of different checks and balances there, uh, but it is very manageable. Like in the open talent, open innovation marketplace, this. This is handled every day, and and you really you can handle the intellectual property. If you need full licensing, you get full licensing. If you need the full IP, you get the full IP. It's really any shade of that that you need is possible and understood in that those communities. Fantastic. I want to switch gears a little bit, and I think some you know sharing some data is important for the audience here. The average adult is said to stay in this job about four years. Millennials about eighteen months. There's greater mobility and from those numbers moving from job to jobs, accelerating even more quickly. At the same time, the rise of the independent workforce has increased from 38 million to 51 million workers, so 35% increase in last year alone. And over two thirds of those 68% are Gen Z and millennials. And it's expected over half the workforce will be independent somewhere between 2023 and 2026, depending on these trends continuing. You know, Rob, what are the implications and how have you seen leading companies adopt strategies to account for these disruptions to the workforce? I think the biggest difference that we see, um, and you know, we work with called half of the Fortune 500 at the company, the companies that are most thoughtful think about talent acquisition or think about talent access. And the companies that I think are hopelessly stuck in the 1990s and the 2000s think about talent acquisition because the stats that you shared are factually true. And as a people leader, you really have two choices. You can either pretend that those stats are not real and say, we're going to do whatever we can to bear hug people and get them to try to work here for 30 years. And the practical reality is that they're not going to. Uh, or you can say, we want to be a best in class, like employer of choice for people for however long they want to work for us. And then they're going to go get a different experience. And surely as a uh, 
barely millennial. Um, I'm uh, intellectually misaligned to people job switching every 12 to 24 months because there's a lot of problems in that for both employers and um, uh, for the employees, but it's a fact. And you can choose to create a environment which uh, onboards people well and gives them context and makes it possible to be there for three weeks or six months or a year. Um, or you can kind of cling to the idea that you're going to get somebody stuck in a seat and uh, be able to have them you know, for decades. And I think the biggest difference there is that um, long-term full-time employment facilitates kind of sloppy management and sloppy career development. The idea being that if somebody's actually sitting outside your office at a desk, you don't need to be particularly thoughtful about how you manage them because they're always going to be there. And so if you don't have anything for them to do on a Thursday, who cares? They're, you, know, you pay them 365 days a year. What I think Catalan Platform has been really good at is helping people break work and atomize it down into its component parts. And I loved everything Steve was saying there um, from a competitive lens or from a sort of confidentiality lens of instead of saying, we're going to just onboard all of these employees against this big body of work, instead thinking critically about what are the actual specific tasks required and who's the best person either within our company with a full-time badge or as a contractor or as a firm to accomplish kind of the job to be done uh, that we need to get at. And once you reimagine work in that way, uh, it takes you out of the, we want to bear hug people and keep them here for 30 years because the reality is they might only be the right person for 18 months. If you are Coca-Cola and you're moving to a different kind of vending machine, you bring somebody in, they're a vending machine expert, it ends in 18 months, you don't need them. And uh, if you look at a lot of the inefficiencies of full-time employment, you see that a lot of it just comes from wanting to retain talent. Like every HR leader is metric on talent retention, when in many cases it might actually be diametrically opposed to the goals of the company to retain those specific people. Yeah, fantastic. Can, can I jump in on that? Absolutely. Because uh, Rob, I think that is right on. And the way I, the way I talk about that is the pace of change is now at a rate that if you think that recruiting and retaining talent is and which we've done for a hundred years is this, the approach, then think about it. You can't onboard your way out of this, this problem. You need folks in your organization who understand these cutting edge technologies. And if you're going to keep hiring them, who are you laying off? Right. But it's, it's not just that you can't get everyone you need. As soon as you bring them on, they're cut off from upskilling with the latest and greatest in largely, right? So you're actually, you're capturing this workforce that then isn't able to grow and, and kind of uh, bob and weave with the technology. Uh, and so we get this kind of stunting of the growth of the workforce. And I think that's why a lot of people are leaving. In fact, I know that's why a lot of people are leaving the workforce uh, because they see that security is in upskilling, not in a job, which is a real paradigm shift. Tom, if you wouldn't mind me, I just quickly yeah, tack on one thing to that. <laughs> um, the, uh, we actually worked a tremendous amount with Shell. They uh, continue to be one of the largest customers of, of Catalan. And the head of the global head of downstream had an incredibly thoughtful way that he explained it to my co-founder, which was the company of 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 25 years ago essentially knew what business they were going to be in. And as a corporate leader, we're, we're fundamentally going to be uh, looking for petroleum, distributing it to gas stations and um, putting it in cars. And that was a excellent assumption for the first 100 years of Shell. Uh, the first 125 years of Shell. And um, now everything they need to do has nothing to do with the things they've done in the last 100 years. And the full-time employment model is perfectly geared to, we want to be way more efficient as an ocean liner because we are going from New York to London and the only thing we care about is speed. Um, in this new world, if your company doesn't even know necessarily what business it's gonna be in 10 years later, instead of all of the spending you're gonna do on an ocean liner, we think you want essentially an armada of small boats and efficiency is not at all the key metric. The key metric is flexibility and ability to say, you know, we thought we were on this journey from New York to London and this is absolutely crazy, but we're gonna make a huge right turn and go to South America. And that the full-time employment model is almost incapable of keeping up with that. And Steve's point about people being frozen when they onboard is uh, unfortunately, I think more or less accurate. Yeah, that's a great discussion. Great discussion. All right, I'm going to change gears again on you guys. Um, 
In a 2016 report, Rand already saw movements toward greater democratization of space, where space is being made accessible to not just global superpowers and multinationals, but also to developing countries, startups, universities, and even high schools. There are stated goals out there to build a space economy. It's accessible to more people and economic gains from all the investments pouring in over the last few years, reaching a broader base. We know greater diversity promotes critical thinking by bringing different backgrounds, talents, and skill sets to the table. Uh, using data from one of the largest areas supporting the space economy that highlights this challenge of bringing different people together to solve hard problems. The, the South Bay, I'm sure a lot of folks are in right now from there, in LA hosts the Space Systems Command, traditional defense companies like Raytheon, Boeing, Lockheed, who position their space divisions outside the gate. SpaceX is right around the corner there in Hawthorne, and all the startup activity has earned the area the name Silicon Beach. When you look at the demographics of that area, it's 71% white, 16% Hispanic, 10% Asian American, and 3% African American. The base provides a local economic impact around $2 billion. Last year's South Bay economic forecast report the most significant economic impact in that area from capital invested was in space activities, totaling over another $8 billion. So space work has brought around $10 billion to an economy where 70 out of 100 people are white, while three out of 100 are African-American. Knowing there can be cultural, familial, additional reasons why certain areas are more diverse than others, it could be a challenge to convince minority groups to relocate to this example area for broader participation in the growing space economy. Rob, how has Catalan addressed geographic or other biases in support of its clients, both on the supply side of talent and the demand side of opportunities? And, and do you have any data that shows how open talent marketplaces uh, can open pathways to participate that may not exist otherwise? For sure. Well, I think uh, talent marketplaces are actually one of the greatest um, distributors and uh, uh, forces for dispersion of economic outcomes that you can have. If you think about the traditional corporation, and I think we all know that the majority of kind of American Fortune 500 companies are not based in San Francisco and New York and, and Dallas and Chicago. They're actually based in places like Peoria, Illinois, and, you know, West Plains, Missouri. Um, what I think you see with open talent marketplaces, particularly ones with a focus on hybrid work and remote work, is that economic opportunity goes to the person truly most capable of taking on the project with significantly less bias. If you think about all of the uh, unfortunate biases built into full-time talent and the ways in which it's acquired, and to your point, a lot of geographic constraints, it's almost impossible to imagine that you will have equitable outcomes from that um, versus a world where you can present talent to employers in a way that is based on uh, objective data uh, using advanced kind of like non-human driven models for this person has this many years experience in this type of role or has a degree in this or has demonstrated this sort of capability. And we've worked with our customers to be incredibly um, deliberate about how matching works. So if you think about how the platform works, there's an unbelievable ability to parcel out economic earnings uh, in a way that few other platforms have. And we obviously take that responsibility incredibly seriously. And from the very beginning, we, uh, I think, overwhelm a lot of the heuristics and biases that um, characterize how talent is matched in the economy. And I think the biggest perpetuator of that, uh, as, as somebody who's clearly benefited, is uh, the names on the resume, the, the specific, particularly with respect to educational institutions. Because I think if you look at some of the best regarded educational institutions in the US, it's, it's not clear to me at all that they're actually some of the best, um, but they're perceived that way. And so when people see a resume from Harvard or you know, Cal Berkeley, they're way more likely to you know, transact uh, than they see another resume. And I think we've, we sort of flipped that on its head. Uh, we didn't see that Harvard Business School people necessarily completely outperformed people from other schools um, or in the early days. And uh, we basically said, no, we're going to do a completely different matching process, which is obviously proprietary, but most over skews to have you demonstrated aptitude for the specific skill set? Have you proven to a person we deem credible that you're capable of doing this? Which, if you actually think about it in a reductive way, is the only way that talent should be matched. And uh, that's, I think, led to a far more equitable um, uh, set of outcomes. And it's also brought people into the workforce um, that have trouble with a nine to five model because they have parental care responsibilities or child care responsibilities, or they're an introvert, or they have a disability that makes commuting difficult. Um, and I think the net of that is a workforce that is far from perfect, but I think is far more kind of exciting and, and, and leads to a great, much greater diversity of minds working on problems. 
Steve, let's let's talk about that a little bit more in the last couple of minutes we have. You know, I look at that as providing operational resilience to your business. And of course, the pandemic really forced us into the thinking more about that, right? Do you have any vignettes that, you know, how NASA's highlighted or been, has benefited from, you know, opening up the organization to those that aren't living in the direct vicinity of, of the major NASA centers and, and what you guys learned in these yeah. last couple of years? Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, our, our team, I think, is a good, good example. We're a fully virtual team. We have folks in California, Colorado, Virginia, Texas, that, and, and so we're, we're living that model out. Um, but I'll just say, we, we by definition, uh, try to engage people from all around the world, right? So our, our roots are all in open innovation. And, and the whole premise of open innovation is that if you're looking for technical solutions in only your technical bubble, you're missing out because the solutions are actually out there in the diversity uh, and innovation is a, a direct relationship with diversity. Um, and I will say in this big technology explosion we've gone through, one of the things that we you should realize is that the technologies out there are easily accessible in building blocks that are used across all industries. So think about it, AI machine learning, 3D printing, cheap sensors and automation and robotics, um, software APIs. These are all things that people learn that actually apply to every industry and every industry is innovating. And so a lot of what you you can get with open talent and open innovation is finding people that you would never hire through the interview process because they don't fit the mold of what you're trying to fit for your organization, but that have access to an understanding of these technologies because they see them in other places and can bring those to bear. Uh, or they simply just have a different perspective. I can tell you stories of you know, a freshman at Berkeley who was learning machine learning, who actually won one of our Homeland Security uh, challenges uh, on, on actually fixing the, uh, the personal scanners at airport, you know, and it was because he brought skills in Blender, which is, you know, an online gaming tool, but he was able to create an entire data set in hours that took DHS millions of dollars to go create, right? And so the, the things people bring into the equation are often uh, unsuspecting uh, and, and not the things. We, we are so bent on the old model of let's bring just the experts together to try to solve hard problems. And I can give you example after example where those people are always going to bring you the same answers and that the 10X solutions are gonna come from outside. Um, in fact, there's an MIT study that looked at Incentive, which is one of these crowd innovation platforms, and they looked at all of the solutions that were coming out of that, and they found that 70% of the time that there was a solution, it came from someone not in the domain of the, the, the problem owner, right? 70% of the time. What have we done for R&D for the last 100 years? We put five chemists in a chemistry lab and say, go innovate and find the next big solution. And this says that that's only going to work 30% of the time. And by the way, that same study showed that 75% of the time, the solver already knew the solution. In other words, it already existed in that other industry. So the reason all this disruption is happening is it's happening over here in another industry and then popping out in your industry. Um, and, and I think we can get ahead of that with these open talent models. So, Fantastic. Rob and Steve, I want to thank you both for taking time to discuss these uh, talent strategies for the aerospace industry and wish you both continued success in helping people and organizations work together more effectively. And thanks again for such great insights today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Yeah, we'll send it back to Dave. We would certainly agree, Tom. Rob and Steve, you guys were just great. But uh, Tom, go look in the mirror. You were just as good, too. So thank you much. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so, so no, much this for is, was It was a great trifecta. We can't thank all three of you enough. Stay uh, stay, uh, stay well. Thank you so much. That was great. I really great. enjoyed that. And it's one of the big problems that we, we have to solve. It's all about talent, making the, engaging the workforce, making work possible. So right. I appreciate uh, their innovation in that. Absolutely. Absolutely.